three. One foundation. This is Jesus our Lord. And then it says in the second verse so wonderfully, elect from every nation, yet one or all the earth. Her, ca her charter of salvation. One Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakers one holy food. And to one hope she presses with every grace endued. Isn't that wonderful? We have one God, one baptism, one faith. And we have one food, the same food. Oh, yeah. And the food comes where? Out? Out of the Bible. But today, beloved, there is much, much, much difference in what it, the church is fed in the world. And that's why we have so many churches, so many different, because it's a different food. It's a different belief. It's a different foundation. Many churches are built on something different than the true church has. The true church has Jesus Christ as a foundation. Now, I wanted to speak today a little bit on, on the subject of organization. How these came into the church. Which is the true organization? Or do we n do not need any organization? Or has the organization become the center of all things? We will find that out. Let us go very far back to the first church. And that is in Act of the Apostle, chapter 7, verse 38. The first church. When do you think the first church was formed? And who brought that church? This verse will tell us. Verse 38 of Act chapter 7. Speaking... Uh, speaking about Moses and about Jesus here. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracle to give unto us. You see, the first church is the church which God created where? In the wilderness and set that church on one foundation. He was the angel which was with that church. He brought that church out of Egypt and established her with different rules and regulations and different order, and she became the church of God, the church in the wilderness. Of course, there was Moses. Moses was the representative of God, so to say, on earth. This has often been abused, beloved, especially here in the New Testament church. We must not forget, Moses was just the mouth speak of God. Moses had no right to legislate any laws. His duty was to enforce the law which God had given him. See, this is in Patriarchs and Prophet. Uh, I think on page 603, I'm not quite sure. But nevertheless... We see he was the mouth speak of God. This has to the time and to the angels very much changed. But beloved, we want to be back to that church with some little change in the New Testament which Christ made. Let us read how Moses, beloved, had this church organized in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. Deuteronomy... Chapter 1, verse 13 down to 15. I would like that you give good attention here how it says, Moses is speaking here. Take you wise men and understanding and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. Who had to choose the man? 
द पीपल द पीपल फ्रॉम द बॉटम केम द चॉइस अप then and moses says i will make them rulers over you and he answered me and said the thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do so i took the chief of your tribes he took he took what the law or what the people had offered do not forget that he took what the people had chosen they had chosen the man So I took the chief of the tribes, wise men, and known, and made them heads over you, captains of a thousands, captains of a hundreds, and captains of a fifties, and captains of a tens, and officers among your tribes. So we see here, we call that maybe today a uh, hierarchy. This is not an hierarchy. It is only when the captains start to. how could i say to rule then it becomes an ayaki but let me just in between time read to you something wonderful in the book education on page uh, 268 education page 268 and it is the paragraph 6 how this uh, system has to work the church is organized for service for service to christ connection with we, uh, with the church is one of the first step the church is organized for service to Christ he is the head not Moses in the new testament but he is the head and you see this is the connection with the church is one of the first step why because you enter into that work of service like we had this morning in the missionary hour you see one give the books another one distribute there another one goes from door to door and so it works in the church for service see and therefore the lord has set various officers there in the days of moses let me turn to testimony to minister how this was in the beginning of adventism on page 26 paragraph 2 as our number increased it was evident that without some form of organization there would be great confusion and the work would not be carried forward successfully there would be no service without organization you see to provide for the support of the ministry for carrying the work in new fields how can that be if it is not organized for protecting both the church and the ministry from unworthy member for holding church property for the publication of the truth to the press and for many other object organization was indispensable she didn't know at that time what kind of form of organization they should take they didn't know but some form they knew something must be done about it this was in the year already 1851 and they worked for about 10 year until they could bring the people to an understanding a wonderful understanding how organization is necessary now beloved the lord has let and guide them that they may understand what kind of a form of organization they must have they studied how was it in the old testament and they came also to exodus chapter 18 we read there and in the verse 21 to 22 
Exodus 18, verse 21 and 22. Now, what do we have there? Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers over thousands, and rulers over hundreds, rulers over fifties, and rulers over ten. And let them judge the people all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. In those days, beloved, when a problem or a case was really unknown, it was hidden from the eyes of everyone. Like, for instance, Achan's case was hidden before Joshua. Nobody knew. But they knew there was a curse. There has been often cases in the days of Moses which nobody knew. So those cases were brought to Moses, and Moses could directly speak with God and ask and find, God, and find out. And the Lord would lead him. If in that case he could not, he could ask the priest. And you know the priest had two big stones here, the Urim and the Tamim. And then they brought the question. And then a light came in one of the stones and he showed them what was right and what is wrong. And so it was in those days. But they had that division set up, man of a thousand, over 100, over 50, and over 10. Let us read now in Testimony, Volume 8, what has been adopted in Adventism to have that similarity of system of organization. We read that in uh, Volume 8, page 236 and 237. Every member of the church has a voice in choosing officers. Who chose the officers? The you see, every member. But the proper way is not that it is, it is done now. The church chose maybe five officers, and then the conference out of those five choose one which they want. That's how it works today. That's not the way. They choose directly the officer. That's how it is. Every member of the church has a voice of choosing officer of the church. The church chooses the officers of the state conference. Delegates chosen by the state conference choose the officers of the union conference. And delegates chosen by the union conference choose the officers of the general conference. By these arrangements, Every conference, every institution, every church, and every individual, either directly or through representatives, has a voice in the election of the man who bear the chief responsibility in the general conference. So you see, we, we call it maybe a hierarchy because it has become a hard rulership, you see. But this was not so in the days of Moses. And that's that, that way that they had functioned. Now, there came a time in the days of Dr. Kellogg's apostasy, you know, when Dr. Kellogg fell off in his idea of pantheism, he wanted to introduce a new organization. And Ellen J. White said, there shall be what? No new organization. There shall be that system that system, who deviates from that system becomes what? A new organization. And we will read also about that. So you see, this is what Ellen G. White means, 
that we shall stand on that system which was in the old covenant and um, which has been introduced after also in the new covenant. There was no kingly power. The kingly power came after the apostasy of Israel and of the priesthood, you see? And that is the power we have today under this garment here. Let me read uh, in Testimony, Volume 1, page 653. Volume 1, 653. That was in the very early days when they wanted to introduce organization, and I will show you how they copied from Moses. 653, under the direction of God. Has God changed from a God of order? No. He is the same in the present dispensation as in the former. Paul says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. He is as particular now as then. And he designed that we should learn lessons of order and organization from the perfect order instituted in the days of Moses for the benefit of the children of Israel. So you see, that's what he wants and that's what they did, followed and have gone. But Moses was never a dictator. Moses never forced the people. He never legislated any law, beloved. He was a guide. He was a leader. He was a shepherd. He went ahead. He constantly said, don't do that, when the people was doing wrong. He said, the ark will not go along with you. And so it was. But if they wanted to go and fight, then he let them do it. You know, in, this, in the situation of the spy, when the Lord has said, you will stay now 40 years here in the wilderness, you will not go in to possess the land. They say, yes, we will go. When he said to them, go, they say, oh, no, 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 we are just as grasshopper in their eyes. We cannot go. And then after a few days later on, they changed their mind and they wanted to go. Moses said, don't go. The ark will not go and I will not go with you. But he never forced them. He did, never disfellowshipped them. He never, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, threatened them. He let them go. The Lord has made, the, for the, the Lord has given them the experiences which they needed. We have uh, a wonderful system of organization here in the sanctuary, beloved. The sanctuary itself showed the most perfect heavenly order. The sanctuary is a little duplicate, a small little thing from the heavenly, and therefore it has to show order. You can see that the tribes were camped around the sanctuary in the most perfect order. The tribe of Judah could not say, oh, I want to be on the north now, or I want to be on the west. No, when they raised up the sanctuary, the tribe of Judah was always on that side, and the other one were always on the other side. And every two tribes were under the banner of one of the major tribe. So that makes three tribes on four, no, excuse me, three tribe with the one which was the major tribe, and so they were four tribes on the three side of the sanctuary. Then we have the most beautiful order of the sanctuary, the service. They could not say, oh, uh, we don't want to have the altar over here. Well, uh, let's put it somewhere else, you see. No, the sinner could not say and bring the lamb and say, I want to bring the lamb here between the altar and the lever. No, I, I, I want to slaughter the lamb here on the front of the door 
of the sanctuary. No, he couldn't do that. He had to come in. They were the place designated for that job. And that's the way they followed it, exactly and perfectly. But today, you see, many people take liberty and do different. They could not say, oh, I want another priest. The priest which was in office and which functioned, that was the priest which took the blood and brought it into the sanctuary. And so everything was done in the most perfect order. Beloved, even the tearing down of the sanctuary and of the building it up again was in the most perfect order. We can read that in Number chapter 3. We have no time to read the whole chapter 3 today. But in Number chapter 3, you had the three sons of Moses which were camped just very near the sanctuary. It's not showing on this picture. But Gershon was here, and then Merari was over there, and the other one, or Merari was here, and the other one, which is... Um, which is the Koat, were on the other side. The three sons, Gershon, Koat, and Merari, were the three designated, the three sons of Moses, to take down. And Gershon had one job, and his job was to take down all what was the, the material, the tent, and uh, the curtains, and uh, the, the skin, of the animals which were covering. That was his job, to take all these down. Merari was the one which had to take down all the posts and carry them. All the, the sight bars was that. And the Koadite were designated to take the piece of furniture which were there. Now a special order was given so that when they take the tent down, nobody can look into the most holy place and see the ark. The curtain here, that curtain, beloved, was taken down and covered up the ark. So when they take the other thing down, the ark was not to be visible. And covered as it was, was transported to another place. And all this was done by order. And beloved, if anyone would not have done it the way as God has said it. He would have died instantaneously. What a punishment. Imagine. So God was peculiar about order. There was no one which said, oh, I, I walk away from it because that's no good. I don't want to have it like that. I have to carry always those heavy weight. And the other one could have said, I have to carry always all those tents and all that material, that linen, and all these, these uh, skins. I don't want to do that. Another one could have said, if I have to carry always on those bars, the altar, my shoulder hurt me. No. They had this order by God, and God has blessed them, let them, and they did the job. It was by condemnation to dead that if anything was disorderly done, then it was not accepted. So peculiar. But today, beloved, what have we today? A good speaker start a church. If it's the church of God or the church of the devil. But they start a church. Isn't that today? Beloved, ordination, ordination, is not something which is just taken up from the air. We will see that in the New Testament church. Let us turn a little bit to the New Testament church in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 to 40. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 to 40. You know, today we uh, have forgotten because most of the time we say, oh, the Old Testament, that is for the Jew. 
But beloved, I tell you, this is a duplicate in miniature of what is going on in heaven. And that's where we want to go, beloved. You see. And so it is in the last days, beloved, just before we enter heaven, that these things have to be brought up again before God's people. We read 1 33 and 40 in 1 Corinthians 14, and look what it says there. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints, as in all churches of the saints, God is what? A God of order and of peace. The order which he had indicated to Moses, to that church in the wilderness, the angel which was walking with it, as we read in the first text in Act chapter 7, verse 38. This is the God which is the God of peace and of order. Verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. All things, beloved, in the church, let it be done decently and in order. Let us read, since we are in 1 Corinthians, in the chapter 7, verse 17. Although that chapter 7, beloved, is the chapter of the relationship of husband and wife, but in the verse 17, as in the family, so there is a text which also relates to the church. It says, But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord has called every one, so let him walk. And so ordained I in all churches. That's what Paul says. Who has called? The God. God has distributed to every man as the Lord has called every man. You see, beloved, we have different talents. Those talents are given by God. I know one talent we all have. We all have 24 hours a day. That is true. We all have. But we have different other talents. And those talents have been given by God. We have heard this morning that we have maybe a few or maybe many dormant talents. This is true too. Oh yes, many talents are dormant. We have never exercised them. They have been given by God, so we have to also bring them up. But this is all, as Paul says, so I ordain in all churches. All churches shall go what? Which way? The same way as God has ordained. In all the world, be it in Africa, Obeyed here in North America. I know in Africa they have some banana leaves or some palm leaves roof, and when it rains, you know, there is a man with a stick which changes a little bit of mat so it doesn't drip right through there at that place. So it is, but it is still under the same order of God. It's the same gospel, beloved. It's the same truth. It's the same message. It's the same place where we will go. It's the same God which has called us to the same gospel. Through baptism, beloved, by the Holy Spirit. How wonderful it is. Let us read in the chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, and we read there the first 1 and 2, how Paul had introduced some um, orders in the churches. 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. He had instituted 
in the churches of Galatia, a kind of a system that when he comes, everything goes fast and wonderfully true. So he introduced that in the church of Corinth. And he said to them here, before he closed his first letter, he said, I institute, I order that too. It functions very well there in Galatia. So this has what Paul did in to have order. But now, let's start from Christ. And let's turn to Matthew chapter 10. Verse 2 to 5. Matthew 10, verse 2 to 5. The very beginning of the New Testament church. Matthew 10, verse 2 to 5. These twelve... Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentile, and into, the, into any city of Samaria, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's up to here. We see that God had sent out what? Twelve apostles. And in the verse 2 you have all the name of the twelve apostles which he had sent out. And he had told them, don't go there for yet. But he ordained these apostles, beloved. He ordained them. It is so wonderfully to know that. It says here, now the name of the twelve apostles are these. And he goes on of the twelve. And he sent them out. He ordained them. Now, as those apostles has been ordained and went unto the work, we read in John chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. John chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. After these things came Jesus and his disciple unto the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in um, Hanan, near to Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. So we see the disciple went forth to baptize. They were ordained. So they went on the job. Let's read in the chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisee had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. So we see the disciple went on to the work and went and baptized the people. It is so wonderful to see that the ordination that God had given, beloved, has not been interrupted up to our days. It is not that Peter stood up of among the twelve and said, Oh, Jesus is delaying to ordain us. Listen, we, we should have one which is ordained so he can baptize. Which one would we elect? And then they start to ordain him. This is what often happens among the independent today. I spoke with a group in Washington, very well working group. And I knew that uh, none of them in the group is baptized. And I say, brothers, how will you work in the future? How will you continue? Who will give you the Lord's Supper if you don't want to go to that church anymore? Which I can well understand. They say, oh, we will elect one, some among ourselves. I say, brother, do you know that the ordination came from Christ down through the ages? It came from the apostle to the Valdenses. And from the Valdenses, beloved, it came to the Christian. They were ordained, beloved. If even they were ordained by a wrong church, that wrong church was once a right church, and it became a wrong church after. 
I mean about the Roman Catholic Church. They have been ordained, and the ordination went down, and went down to Philadelphia Church. And you know that James White was an ordained from the Baptist Church. It was the wrong church at that time, but it was the right church before. And they continue and ordained. They ordained Brother Loughborough. So wonderfully. And the work went on. And the work goes on down right into the reform movement, beloved. You see. It is not that something is lightly taken. The Lord had ordained those men in the Old Testament for the sanctuary, and it went on like that. And the Lord has ordained 12 apostles, not one Moses. There is the change which is in the New Testament. He has ordained 12, not one Moses, which was the mouth speak, but 12, because it was necessary. The Lord knew that the church will deviate and will elect one man, like a Moses or like a Peter, which have the key, you know, the key and can open heaven and can close it again. But this is not so. He has ordained 12. We will read about that too, a little further on. But we see here, so the ordained apostle went on, and they ordained elders. Paul ordained elders later on. This one of those apostles even ordained Paul, and he ordained others as they went to churches. Let's read in Acts chapter 6, verse 3 to 5. Acts 6, verse 3 to 5 that there was a necessity for more officer as they had only at the beginning. Ellen G. White says, as the work grew, we needed some form of organization. So we see here, as it grew in the New Testament, they needed something more. And it says, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you. Can you see that? Not we will choose. No. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give yourself continually to prayer and to ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose seven and they chose Stephen, uh, Stephen, yes, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and um, Procerus, and uh, Nicamor, Nor, and Temon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, and a proselyte of Antioch. So they chose here seven men. Can you see? And those were then ordained as deacon by the apostle. But who chose them? Who select them? It was the church member. They proposed them. How wonderful. This is the work which went on, which was started in the Old Testament. This is the work which should be also today. We read in Act chapter 11, verse um, 22 and 24, but we know also that there were deaconess. I will skip that because the time is already advanced. But in Romans chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, there are some deaconess which have been elected too. So now we will turn to Act 11, and we shall read there verse 22 and 24. Then tiding of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was at Jerusalem. This is where the twelve apostles were. At that time there were no twelve, because we know some have been killed, James and other. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. So we see here, beloved, that... Um, Barnabas was sent forth. What for? Let's read first 23 and 24. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost 
and of faith. And much people was added unto the church. He organized churches, beloved. He went out. Much people were added where he went through. And so he was the one which was sent by the apostle, and he went and organized churches on his way. We read in the chapter 13, verse 11, uh, 1 to 4. Now, if I say organized churches, that means he had elders, he had deacons, deaconess, and all kind of officers in that church, which he organized and went on. And this was recognized by the main church in Jerusalem. I read Act 13, 1 to 4. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simon, Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manhain, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid a hand on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. So here were again missionaries sent out. They have ordained them and sent them out. Now all these could be applied in a very dictatorial way. But let's read in the scripture how the Lord has left freedom to man to think and to act according to the Holy Spirit, not directly only of the church in Jerusalem. Let us read, for, for instance, uh, such an example in Act chapter 8, verse 26 to 29. Act 8, 26 to 29. Now, Philippus was without doubt an ordained minister. But look how it says here. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. Now, Philippus have not said to the angel, Oh, I'm sorry, angel. I have to ask first a union conference if I can do that. I, I, I'm sorry. My license comes from there, you see, my credential. Uh, that's, that's too bad. I'm sorry. I gladly will go if you send me the union president and he will give me a letter that he's agree or another or the, the state conference. He never said anything. What it says in the first 27, and he rose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority on the Cadessus queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. You see, they had a freedom, which today is no more possible. Pastor, he cannot do because uh, the conference, you see. The Holy Spirit is quenched. Here the Holy Spirit is free. I can show you another place. Let us read in Acts chapter 19, 